Welcome to the Boomer Woman's Podcast. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. When today's guest contacted me, I didn't hesitate to agree to having him on podcast. Many of us have launched our kids, but I know a lot of you still have young adults living in. Is that their choice or your choice? If you are an average North American family, it could well be time to have that young adult claim their independence. Jack can help with that. He provides information, education, guidance, and resources to parents of young adults who are struggling to launch or let go while maintaining a positive, caring relationship with their young adult. Such a nice blend of professional opinions and personal experience. Jack makes it sound so achievable. I really enjoyed this conversation. Listen now. I've always been a tough love kind of mom. My kids know I'll always be a safety net, but there's no permanent return. Maybe that's partly to do with my mom. I got a job in her town when I was about 25. Mum kindly asked if I'd like to stay with her for two weeks until I found my own place. The condition worked for both of us. But I do know people who have an adult child living in. The story is the usual one, just so they can save enough money to get their own place. There are too many gray areas in that comment for me. And now, with the current economic and housing conditions, that child could be living in for decades. My guest today probably could share more stories than we have time for. Jack provides information, education, guidance, and resources to parents of young adults who are struggling to launch or let go while maintaining a positive, caring relationship with their young adult. As always, there's two sides of the story, the young adult who won't adult or the parents who won't let go. I'm old-fashioned, so I know there's more substance to the issue than I can acknowledge, so let's get started. Jack Stoltzfus, welcome to the Boomer Woman's Podcast. Thank you, yes. They're great to be here. I'm looking forward to this because I'm so so one-sided on the conversation, so it's going to be really interesting to see more more angles. Now, Jack, launching in, in my day, we couldn't wait to get out of the house and independent from our parents. What's changed? Well, I think what's changed is that uh, that parents have become more heavily invested in the happiness and success of their kids than the generations of the past. I think in the generations of the past, you turned 18 or 21, hey, I've done my job, we'll see you. But starting, I think, with this boomer generation, we started to invest more of our emotional needs into the kids being happy and being successful. And unfortunately that keeps extending into the twenties, you know, and and early on, you know, okay, maybe you could stay here at 22, 23, but then the alarm bells start to go off at 26 and 27. That person's still there. And they start thinking like you were saying, is this person going to be here forever or what? So I I think that's, that's my main kind of theory about what's happened over time. But there are other complicating factors. Clearly today, economic issues play a role in in kids staying at home. It's very tough to get out. The apartment costs are high. You can't buy a house. You have to pay a lot for apartments so you can't save for the house. So I think that's that's been a, a, a complicating factor for today's young adults and parents. So. Right. I was probably a little bit older than many of my peers when my kids were in school, but I did notice some of those, and I'm, I shouldn't classify this because I'm sure there were some my age as well. We called them helicopter parents, oh, yeah. where they were always in there and, and having a finger into whatever the kids were doing. Are those the parents that might be hanging on now to not like worrying about everything? Oh, I think absolutely. I mean, that's kind of the extreme example. I, I sent my daughter to college, you know, about five miles away from here. And I have a story I can tell about that. But I remember talking to the dean of students who said there was a mother who would come in every day and, and pick up their son's laundry. And she was from out of town, miles out of town, clean his room and pick up his laundry and then come back the next day and do the same. I mean, that's the ultimate 
helicopter parent. Uh, but, you know, I, again, I think it goes back to some worry, concern, you know, they're, they're, they're not happy. No, I'm, they have to be happier. They're not succeeding. And so the parent ends up extending more effort, putting more effort, which sometimes can backfire in terms of, you know, the kids saying back off, you know, I, I don't need your, your involvement on these things too. So I was going to tell you, tell you a quick story about my daughter. So I sent my daughter to the school. First of all, she wanted to go to New York. I'm in Minnesota. She wanted to go to New York school of acting. I said, it's not going to happen. It's not, I'm sorry. You know, we had good colleges around here. So she chose one about five miles away. And uh, early on, she, she calls one night and she says, uh, dad, I, you know, I'm, I was late getting down to the dining hall and it's closed. Could you bring a sandwich over to me? <laughs> After I picked myself off the floor from laughing hysterically, I said, what, what planet are you from? I'm not bringing a sandwich over to you. <laughs> and then, oh, okay, you're not going to do that? Okay, no, I don't think you're going to starve to death either. So, But then I hung up, and then I started thinking, how did she ever get the idea that I would bring a sandwich over there? It must be me. <laughs> you know, when you say, okay, these kids are really entitled, I think we have to ask the question, well, who's entitling them, you know, if that's the case? So it was just a funny story. And I thought, my gosh, am I sending that kind of message that, hey, I'm going to hop in the car with a sandwich. When I was in college, I didn't want my parents anywhere near the college. So. Yeah, it's it's interesting, too. And I guess the, the automatic thought is, thank goodness she wasn't in New York asking for that sandwich. <laughs> That'd be a long drive with a sandwich. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, dear. Now, now the world... I was going to say might seem, but I, I'm sure it is in some ways more dangerous now. But should parents just believe in the idea that their kids are smart enough to, to manage to figure it out? Well, uh, I think that's part of the letting go process. And it, you know, it just doesn't start at the time of the young adult launch stage. I mean, if you're not letting go along the way, like, ride your bicycle around the block to visit your friend. I mean, it can start at that stage. I mean, every, it seems like all the way through the raising of a child, there's a period of holding and then letting go. I mean, from the earliest toddler stage, you hold and then they, you let go and then you hold and then, okay, they're getting on the bus. It's another letting go. Oh my gosh, I'm turning this person, my little boy or girl over to it bus driver, I don't know, you know, in the school. And then it goes on high school. And then, the, you know, the other one is a driving, they get their license. And now it's like, got to worry about that. But there, each of those are an opportunity to let go, let out more string on the kite, so that the, the, the child can begin to start to make some decisions on their own and start to stretch out a bit. And, you know, then when they go off to work or off to college, it's that next stage of, of letting go too. Part of the challenge is some of these kids are staying at home and they're not, they're not, maybe they've got a job, but maybe they don't. I see a certain number that are, that are kind of stuck, or I call them stalled at home in the development process. And they're playing video games late into the night and sleeping till noon and Parents are saying, "Why don't you know? You need to make a decision, get a job, or something." Well, I'm, I, you know, I don't. Th I'm a little anxious about that. I don't know if I can do that. And so, and the parents, I think, can often kind of coddle them too much and say, oh, "Okay, I don't want you to be anxious." You know, well, maybe I'll, I'll drive you there, <laughs> and then you could apply for the job. You know, sometimes you have to kind of pull them out of the house versus just kind of pushing them out of the house. So. Coming into this conversation today, I realized that I might have moments of, oh, was I a good parent or a bad parent? But one phrase that I've often used is that the statute of limitations on parenting ends when they turn, well, 18, but when they finish high school. And what I mean by that is if I haven't instilled you know, the, the beliefs and the responsibility and all that stuff by then, it just might be too late. Yeah. 
where, where do you draw the line between, and I'm obviously, as I said in my intro, I will always be a safety net, but in terms of, you know, always telling them, and even you said, you know, about success, my idea of what my kids' success should look like might be totally different than how they define success. Mm-hmm. And, and where do we let go and sort of go like, okay, it's their life. Yeah, I think one of the letting go challenges for parents is letting go of the vision that the parent has of who that child will become or who that what that child's going to do. And sometimes they can start fairly early. And, and some of these high powered families have the plans for Harvard or Yale from about five years old on. So we're going to get the best skills. We're going to get extra tutoring to get you there or whatever. And then, you know, at, at one case of um, a young adult male who had college all planned out, the father was going to, mother going to support him going to a college, I think in Wyoming or Montana or something like that. Uh, and it was fully paid for and everything. And the last minute he said, I'm not going to go. I don't want to go. You know, And so he ends up kind of delivering pizzas and staying at home, uh, eventually going into a skilled trade school on his own, but he, they had to make that adjustment. Well, once, you know, they had visions of him being in the school that the father attended and, you know, all had this whole thing basically mapped out. And now they have to say, okay, maybe we have to change the map, our vision about this. So I I think that's true that that's one of the letting go processes that needs to take place. So is is part of being a parent being a good actor i can remember each time one of my kids left home being excited telling them to go have an adventure and then having a good sob in the car when they were on their plane yeah i think it's there's it's a um bittersweet kind of experience i think when that child leaves and you, uh, you, you're celebrating, you're recognizing it. You think this is great. This is the way it should be. And yet, it, yet you're looking at it and saying that you, you're going to miss that. All once the, the family changes. I remember when uh, my daughter uh, got engaged and I was told my son and future son-in-law was going to come over and ask for her hand in marriage or whatever, ask me for that permission. And I was upstairs. I at the time I worked at 3M, and I was having computer problems. <laughs> and, and and my wife came up and said, "You know, our, our future son-in-law's downstairs waiting for you to come down." And you know, I said, "Okay, I'll be down there in a little bit." Well, it was seven o'clock. He was there, and now it's getting closer to seven thirty. And I'm getting my wife is coming up there, and now she's not really patient about it at all. And then I finally get downstairs and. And they're all glaring at me, my wife and my other daughter and my future son-in-law. And and I gave the, the blessing on that. Unlike my father-in-law who said, you know, if you can afford her, you can have her. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what I realized is I was, I was resisting the change of the family. This was the end of the family of what, what I always knew as our family. And uh, by doing this, now we have a new member to the family. It'll never be the same again. It'll never be just us. And I, you know, I was kind of subconsciously resisting it, I think. You know. I had that conversation with a, a guest recently. We, we were talking about perimenopause and grieving and, and stuff like that. And I, I realized that, yeah, like every time one of those children strike out on their own, or as you just said, they're marrying someone outside of your, your tight family unit. There is, it is a type of grieving. And Mm -hmm. I guess you just got to be the stronger person and say, that's the way things go. You know, it's, uh, Mm -hmm. especially in our culture, it's, uh, yeah, they, they move on, they do their thing. It's it's the normal loss a norm, and a normal grieving process, and I think that people need to uh, acknowledge that, not try to kind of suppress that and just say, "Well, wait, I am sad about 
be leaving, you know, and and be more more honest and transparent about that because it's it's a natural uh, part of the experience. So right, right. Now, in this day and age, and probably even in to a certain extent in my day and age, um, the only way a family could manage financially was to have both parents working. Um, mm. I remember feeling the guilt because I had to be at work instead of available for a child. Does that guilt remain and contribute to, oh, I, you know, I missed out on some of the things that they might have needed me for, so I'm just going to let them stay at home a few more years and like it appeases your guilt, perhaps, even if it doesn't necessarily help your child. Uh, yeah, I think that um, guilt is one of the what I would call binding emotions that keep the parent and the and the young adult or the child emotionally f- kind of fused in a negative sense. Uh, guilt, shame, fear resentment, some of these kinds of things that parents will experience will create this negative bind, a negative connection to the young adult. So one of the practices that I, there's two practices that I promote as part of the what I call the healing practices to address those issues. And one is that the parent needs to focus on apologizing if they feel like they ne- didn't do something or did something that causes them to still feel guilt about their parenting. Or in some cases, if they're angry at the child and they're resentful about the child, then they need to practice forgiveness at that point. But I don't think you can, you can move in a, in a healthy launch process if you have those unresolved feelings because they keep you kind of stuck uh, psychologically and emotionally with the young adult and keeps the young adult stuck too. Yeah. Now you're, you're in practice. You, you, do you see people when you sort of say, well, he, here are some things you have to look at, uh, apology, forgiveness, that sort of thing. Is it like a light for them or can there be resistance? I've got nothing to apologize for, or, um, you know, like I'm not going to forgive them for that. How do, how do you get that across that this is really a part of the healing and then you got to heal before you can move on? Yeah, it's it's not always always well received in in, in my conversations and work counseling work with uh, parents. And I've got, you know, there are a couple of instances where the, the fathers and said, basically, uh, why should I apologize I did it for their own good, you know, uh, my intentions were good, you know, well, and I say, well, if you're standing in line in in the store and you bump into somebody, you apologize, you didn't intend to, but you apologize. And I I kind of challenge parents to, to be the bigger person, to take the high road and, you know, yeah, okay, your, your kid was a jerk too. But you, you know, but take responsibility for some part of what you did that maybe wasn't that helpful. You don't have to say, I, you know, I'm, I'm a terrible father or I'm a terrible mother or whatever. But yeah, I think I could have done this better and I, I'm sorry. Or I, I said this and I'm sorry. Just those, those kinds of gestures can do so much to kind of heal the relationship, particularly if the, if the young adult is angry at the parent and, you know, kind of holding a grudge. You didn't do this, you did that. The parent can make that apology that helps with the parent's guilt, but also reduces the extent to which the young adult can continue to hold that grudge. Okay, my dad or mom apologized. It, it softens that, that anger and that resentment that that young adult may, may hold on to too, so. This is sort of going out into left field a little bit, but at what age does the young adult child realize that there's no manual for parenting? We do the best we can and hope for the best. And some of us mess up, some of us pass with flying colors, uh, but that apology is really meant to sort of, it's sincere. 
Yeah, I, I, our oldest daughter that I referenced earlier with the sandwich routine has acknowledged, I gave you guys a really a hard time, didn't I, when I was in my teen years? Yeah. So you get a little of that, but now what's what I'm getting from, I have three adult children, 11 grandchildren. We're starting to get to, now I understand what you're dealing with, with these kids, with, with us, you know. So, you know, sometimes it takes them having to experience that role of parenting to be able to reflect back and uh, appreciate, you know, how, how difficult it was maybe for, for their parents to, to, you know, deal with challenges and, and raising kids. So I'll, I'll share a real short story here. When my eldest child, my daughter had her first child, we were out for a walk and he was a tiny, tiny infant in a, in a stroller. And she turned to me and she said, thank you, mom. And I went, um, you're welcome. Like what for? And she mm. says, now I know how much you love me. Mm. And, you know, cause she, <laughs> isn't that nice? Oh yeah. <laughs> bring, bring tears to your eyes. Well, huh? it does. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Had to contemplate yes. whether to tell that story or not. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've got a few like that too, yeah. that I have to kind of have a hard time with. Yeah. Yeah, so that's great, isn't it? When that finally comes around, that that kind of affirmation of you as a parent. So, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it doesn't, but a lot of times I think it does. There's a, there's an appreciation once they become the parent. So, yeah. Well, and hopefully the lines of communication are open enough that they will actually share that thought. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, just going to talk about the kids for a moment. I understand living with parents if they're at school, post secondary. But when they stay on beyond that, are they just comfortable with the lifestyle or are there, is there some fear about the big bad world outside the door or like, like what are the primary reasons for staying at home, like with their, in their parental home uh, once they're earning a paycheck? Uh, well, uh, there's, there's probably a, a number of uh, uh, contributors to that, <clears throat> that phenomena today. We talked a little bit about the economic situation mm -hmm. and I, that's probably the one I see the most. I don't, I, I can't afford an apartment right now. My job is such that I can't afford the apartment. And, and what I, now I, I kind of back up. I, I tell parents that if you've got a young adult living at home, they need to either be going to school, working, or maybe they're doing some volunteer, but Doing nothing is not not is not an option, you know, type of thing. But anyway, uh, if they are working, then they should be doing adult stuff around the house and being more like a roommate, where they cook some meals and they do their own laundry and they clean the room and do that type of thing, and and pay some rent. Although I, I encourage the parents to bank that rent money. <laughs> so they can use it for a security deposit or whatever when they, when they leave. So, but I, I, you know, there's some, <laughs> I've heard some people say, make it as terrible as you can at living at home, then they'll move out. You know, one person made the, the 18 year old move out of the house and had them on an air mattress outside of their room. And I've heard somebody else say, put them in, in a, they have to sleep in a closet or something. I'm, that's not my approach to it. My approach is teach them all the independent adult things they need to do, charge them rent. At one point, they're going to say, well, I might as well be living on my own. I'm cooking my meals. I'm doing this and I'm paying rent. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the idea. <laughs> so. Now, I'm the first to admit it can be hard. Um, I can remember living in some questionable accommodations. I can remember living in accommodations I shouldn't have been affording. I mm -hmm. ran up my first credit card. I drove a beater car. I can remember living for days on like day old bread and then some jam my mother had made. Is that no longer acceptable? Uh, I think you're, you're touching on a, a, a terribly important point here. And this is where I think the, the overinvestment in the happiness and success of the, of the, children today has led to uh, a loss of the development of, of grit 
or resiliency in, in our kids these days. So it's too soft and they don't have to try that hard. Oh, I'll take care of that. Or, oh, you had, you know, don't worry about that. I'll, I'll pay for that. And, it, and it's too, I think parents too often take away the opportunity for the young adult to struggle in some way, which, which creates the, the grit or the resilience that they need by, by jumping in too quickly to take care of the problem. Oh, well, I'll pay for that. Or don't worry about that. No, you know, you need to pay for that. Let's work out a way that you you had a car accident. You're going to, there's a, you know, a deductible and you're going to have to pay some, that's your responsibility, you know, not, well, we'll take care of it. It's not a problem. So that's not the real world they're going to face out there. You know, when they get their own car, you know, they're going to have to pay that deductible. Why not have them pay now and learn about that? Or maybe a match, I always say, okay, they don't make that much money. We'll match it, but you're going to pay half of it, you know, for that accident. So, yeah. And I, I think it's the same old story too, that if you can afford to go out and party, you can certainly afford your own groceries. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, that sort Absolutely. of thing. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, you know, we, we talk about the parents giving them a, gentle push um at, yeah. at what point in time does that gentle push become more of a shove i use that word carefully yeah <laughs> well yeah i have to uh, i'll give a shameless pitch for the book that i have coming out here oh good should be out this month uh, it's it's entitled the parents launch code loving and letting go of our adult children and one of the things that i say is that I think it's it's something that parents can do rather than pushing their kids out of the house, pulling them out of the house so that you get them out and you do something with them. So the young adult at home, and I've got some situations where they're maybe they're depressed. In fact, a common theme is these young adults go to college. They don't know why they're there. They flunk out the first semester and they're back home and they're depressed now because they, they, you know, they feel shame about flunking out and they're anxious and they're sitting around and the parents are saying, well, I don't want to push them over the edge. Well, you know, if they're, if they can't work right away, then, then volunteer. I'll, we're, we'll volunteer together. Uh, one mother is doing uh, Meals on Wheels, a program where you take meals to elderly people that are shut in. So she takes her, this young adult with her. And um, then at some point you can kind of back out and say, well, you need to go. I've got something else I have to do today. So you kind of, so you're, you're getting them out, you know, to just sit there and say, you need to go out and get a job or you need to do, you need to go to the gym, work out or something. Well, I think parents can do, can be more helpful if they try to pull the person out rather than just kind of push them out. But in terms of the question of leaving the home, I, I'm not big on, you know, by December 1st, you're, you're out of here. But I think it's good to say some kind of range. Listen, you know, let's shoot for, you know, the first of the year. And what do you need to ha- accomplish to get ready to move out? by the first of the year and let's work on that. And I really try to bring parents and young adults, parents and the young adult children together in a partnership uh, relationship on the future. And, and that's based upon three assumptions I make. One is that the parents love their kids. The kids love the parents and the parents want, and the kids want to be happy, successful, self-sufficient and independent. And they like the process of moving in that direction to go smoothly. So the parent, I never have a disagreement between the parents and the young adults on the, those assumptions. So why don't we work together, partner on your vision, the young adults vision, not the parents vision of where they want to be. I use a five year uh, time frame where they want to be in five years. And then I kind of back it off and say, and what do you need to do in six months? And, three months and two weeks to get going in that direction. And my goal is to get some momentum going, get them 
moving out of this uh, static kind of situation they're in. But now the parents and, and the kids and we're all working together. It's not like they're, oh, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you getting a job? And this, we're all, we've all got the same uh, vision and kind of playbook that we're working on. So that, that model has really been working well for me. So. What came to mind there was life skills. And yeah. some of the life skills that, as far as I know, aren't taught in the schools. And as parents, we probably, most of us, probably don't do enough, is things like um, handling your money, budgeting, um, learning to cook, learning how to shop, all that sort of stuff. Do you see that? That I mean, it can be a scary place out there if, if you don't have a clue where, how, how, that, where, how far that paycheck is going to go. Oh, I mean, yeah, sure. That's, um, so, so within the context of them moving toward this being self-sufficient and independent, they need to have certain skills. And so that's part of the discussion. Okay, five years you want to be here. What are you going to cook? Okay. How are you going to take care of your the finances? You know, so how do you, how do you deal with your car maintenance and stuff? So the, and, and I always, I always encourage the parents and the young adult to view the parents role as consultants to them so that the parent can be available to say, okay, here's some things I'd suggest you work on or here, I'll teach you some of these things, but it's going to be your responsibility. So I, I turn I, I, kind of a sandwich approach. I'm going to give you some advice here, but it's your responsibility. And then I give the advice and they said, but it's your responsibility. But that's where I think that there can be more partnership between the parents and the young adult. What about your health insurance? What about your car insurance? You know, how, how, how are you going to handle your dri the driving stuff that you need to do your maintenance and things like that? Now, you touched on it briefly, but mental health issues, there seems to be a lot more concern nowadays, and maybe even, I don't know if it's, if there's more mental health issues, or whether we just know more about it now, but oftentimes those issues in your child will have surfaced, you know, prior to finishing grade 12, graduating, mm -hmm. but if if some of those issues arise in their late teens what do parents do to help i guess to approach the issues without it sounding like they think their kids <clears throat> have a problem uh yeah well i i guess i don't know whether they're the, on the issue of greater identification of mental health issues or more greater prevalence, but it clearly the statistics are indicating, particularly with the the Gen Z group now, a uh, high, much higher rate of anxiety and depression. In fact, it, it kind of got high during the COVID period of time and it hasn't gone down. And it's in the 50% range of reporting depression or anxiety. So it, it's significant with that group, more significant than any other any other segment of the population. I, I run into the question of, is it depression or is it failure to launch? And I know that's an either or question by answer is yes. <laughs> it's both because what happens is now, you know, I, I should qualify this. There are some kids that have more what's called uh, endogenous depression or condition where it happened, started earlier high school, junior high or whatever, and they have bouts of depression. And then now they're, they're in college or something and they're ending up with these bouts of depression. But but quite a few uh, have not had that history and they're anxious or they're facing depression, experiencing depression and they're living at home. And I think it's part of the depression and part of the anxiety is that they are living at home they don't want to tell their friends they're living at home. Sometimes the parents don't want to tell their friends Johnny's in the basement, you know, at home type of thing. So there's certain kind of, they know they're not where they should be or where they want to be. 
and that contributes to depression. So I think they kind of, there may be some, some depression that kind of came from some other source, but I do think that the failure to move forward in their lives is a continuing contributor to that depression. So that I think therapists need to deal with not just the symptoms of depression, but how to get them on track moving forward, you know, and not just, okay, we're going to medicate you and teach you some skills, cognitive behavioral therapy skills or whatever. But if they're not getting a job, if they're not going to school, if they're not becoming more independent, it, it's not going to help a whole lot. A pill is not going to help them with a job, you know. So it's, you know, I, I see it as, I, I see it's a problem that I have to deal with and parents have to do their best to try to try to kind of influence the young adult to get help. Sometimes you can kind of frame it in terms of stress. Okay, look, you're under a lot of stress. You know, school isn't worked out or you're struggling with that. And why don't we get you somebody can help you with the stress? That sounds better than you're depressed. And let's get you to, to somebody who's going to give you medication. And a lot of the young adults don't want a medication. They're kind of anti-medication uh, oriented. So Now, you mentioned the pandemic. And obviously, that really changed family dynamics in a lot of families. I mean, these young people had to move back home. They'd lost their jobs, you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But... There's also outside of pandemic and all the rest of it, those young people who, for whatever reason, whether they've decided they want to save for something, whether their roommates moved out, they they quite assertively tell their parents they're going to come back home as though they're doing the parents a favor. How do parents respond to that? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I tend to encourage parents to when they think of the person, their young adult leaving the house, think of that as a one-way ticket. <laughs> and there wouldn't be a, a return flight on that, uh, with some exceptions. You know, now my daughter, uh, youngest daughter, on her, her fifth year of college, she changed majors and had a fifth year of college, moved back home before she got married, saved money, could study better at home, but it was a very clear understanding that, that she was not going to continue beyond that point. And it was fine. She, we liked to have her. My wife was kind of sad when she left too. So, so, you know, I, I, I think there has to be real clarity about why you're coming back, how long you're staying and how, how is it, how do you get to the place of leaving? What, what's involved in, you're needing, you're getting to the place where you're going to leave again, because you need to be on your own. I mean, that's, that's the right, right thing to do. Although I have, I guess I have to qualify that a little bit because, because in a large part of the world, you have two and three generation living together. So there are some young adults who are living at home. They've got a full-time job. They're paying rent. They have a good relationship with the parents. Uh, they're handling all their responsibilities. They're cooking dinners and all. I can't, I can't criticize that or think that that person hasn't launched just because they're living in the house. So it's, that's my, my litmus test is not that you've left the house. It's whether you're independent, demonstrating this responsible independence. So. So my mother did come to mind there briefly telling me I could stay for two weeks till I found a place. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, I think you want to be clear about that. You want to say, well, come on back and we'll figure it out. No, I think <laughs> let's talk about how long you're going to be here before you come through the door and how that's going to work. So, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we chuckle as we say that and, and perhaps we have to come into it with a bit of a sense of humor to keep it lighter. You know, like mm -hmm. we're, we're not, sort of putting the drawbridge down on our kids and if the spikes go yeah. to their their neck so what it's a matter of let's just define what's going on here and i do agree with you that there's there's households and cultures out there where the multi-generational works really well so mm -hmm. um, yeah so i guess there's always you got to look at the big picture now mm -hmm. our listeners are boomers 
some of the kids who aren't launching might well be their grandchildren. Sure. Now, there's arguments to be made. I want to help my grandchildren. And if a young person lives with the grandparents, they can help out with chores, safety, etc. Is is that a thing? And, and what's your take on that? Because that is also a slippery slope. Well, um, you know, I think that harkens back to days ago when when families and extended families all lived in the same community and you'd end up at your uncle's place or your grandparents and and then it was much more fluid and it worked out pretty well okay i'd spend a few days with my grandparents and be back home and all so i think generally that's a good thing you know and sometimes that it's a it's a stress with the parents and and the grandparents seem to have a better you know grandparents are ultimately not responsible for the grandchild so the relationship can be a little bit less um demanding controlling and that type of thing so it can work out pretty well if they're you know where i would not uh encourage that type of thing is when there's a there's some kind of, there's really an antagonistic kind of relationship where there's drug usage or there's some, you know, stealing or different problems like that. You don't want to move that to the grandparents, you know, but sometimes these kids are really struggling with the family, but really enjoy their grandparents and do better, do better. And it can be their bridge to being on their own. So, I mean, each situation, you have to kind of weigh the, the pros and cons of that. So, right. Now, one of the stats you have in your profile is that one in four young adults cut off communications with the parents. Yeah. I, I can't imagine. Can, can you talk to that, please? Yeah, this is something that's been more recent in terms of just some of the findings on this. Now, the good news about that is that that typically lasts for only about four months and then they kind of reconnect. That's on average. Although there are clearly some young adults who who just go off the, the radar and they don't reconnect ever with their parents, which, which I think is a heartbreaking situation for parents and damaging to both the parent and the child. They're, they're living in, in this kind of wounded kind of experience that's going to have repercussions for other relationships, I think, as well. So, so it's, it's a real challenge to be able to kind of manage those situations. There's a author uh, named as a colleague of mine, Josh Coleman, who wrote a book on the rules of estrangement. And he talks about this, this growing phenomena of estranged young adults. Uh, and, and he says that of the people that he's worked with, that he's worked with, I suspect now hundreds, if not thousands. And his research says that 75% of those young adults who have cut off the relationship with one or another parent come from divorce situations where there has been some alienation that has taken place and maybe some loyalty to one parent not the other parent for whatever reason. So I know that's, that's a contributor to this, but, and, and he's doing, he does a lot of really good work in trying to kind of re help repair those, those situations, those relationships. He's got a good website. I think it's called joshcoleman.com or whatever too, but it's, it's, it's a growing concern. And there was a article in the New York times, not too long ago, maybe the last month, where a therapist was promoting uh, ending your relationship with your parents, cutting off your relationship with your parents, that that would be a good thing to do. You don't need them anymore and they're not helpful and be uh, meddling in your life. And so it's best just to cut them off. Now, I mean, he said, he talks about toxic situations and, and there are clearly some situations if you've been physical or sexual abuse and, you don't want to have anything to do with a parent anymore. I can understand that. But his was more like, it, it, this is the healthy thing to do. And I, and I adamantly disagree with that perspective. So, 
Ooh, that's a little scary to me. <clears throat> as I say, as you said, I can understand if there's been abuse and, and that yeah, sort sure. of a situation. But generally speaking, we all have our ups and downs and relationship sure. squabbles and stuff like that. Yeah. I have a random question, but I th and I think you've addressed it. Um, I was interested to find a list of volunteer opportunities for young adults. Is that because, as you told us earlier, it's something that a parent can do to actually pull the kid out of the house? Absolutely. Yeah. So when I, when I propose that, okay, they're not working, they're not going to school, then let's, let's get, and they're too anxious to, you know, I had one kid just too anxious to even apply for jobs. He didn't want the rejection on, you know, well, okay. Then you can't sit here and do nothing, play video games. So you're going to volunteer or, or you can paint the house or something, but you just can't be, you know, squat here, basically. So then here are all these volunteer opportunities. And again, I, you know, parents spend a certain amount of time with a person, young adult like that living in the home, you know, <laughs> harassing them about do it. Why don't you get out of here? Why don't you get to work? Do some, spend some of that time, take them into a volunteer situation. It's a great opportunity where you know, they want a warm body that they're, they're accepting in these, these agencies. Oh, thanks. Come in, you know, help out. And now you, and you get, you got to build a social network there, maybe even network and get a job out of it too. So, but it's just getting them out and getting them connected to other people. And there's not, I think it's one of the best things you can do around depression is help somebody else, you know, do something for somebody else too. So. Yeah, I, I think there's always some sort of sense of fulfillment if you've been able to give yourself to some cause, you know, whether yeah. it's the environment or a person or Oh, whatever. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, one thing I want to touch on um, that I did see on your website is a child with a disability. Now, I've provided home shares for persons with intellectual de delays What's your take on that? Um, parents of children with any disability can really be overprotective. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, and it, it's one of the categories that I, I in, in the book, I describe four different categories of failure to launch. Uh, one is the stalled, stalled individual. The other is kind of uh, the impaired individual. And this is somebody with learning disabilities, Asperger's, you know, uh, maybe other kind of mental or physical kind of problems. And then there's the derailed person, which is the si significant mental illness or substance abuse, you know, that they're, they're off the tracks, you know, uh, and they're not going to get back until you address the, those problems directly. And then the last one is that estranged young adult that's kind of cut off. But the second category of, of where there's some kind of physical or mental kind of limitation that we're, we're trying to kind of work with, I would argue that that they those kids, those young adults, all want to move toward being more independent. In general, there might be some exceptions to that. So as much as the parents can do to support that independence, that's that's a positive thing both for them and for the for the young adult. So maybe they can't do certain things, but, you know, they can work in a shelter workshop or they can do, you know, some other things along the lines of volunteering or whatever that could be helpful, you know, and in some cases that, you know, if it's a very severe situation, we've had a couple of colleagues with, with um, autis autistic kids where they had to put them into a group home. They just couldn't kind of manage them at home. But but I think in general, how can we stretch this young adult to do a little bit more than, you know, what they think they're capable of? And I would think sometimes parents are, some of these parents uh, don't see the the potential there to stretch. And there's a certain amount of, I like to call it stretch rather than push them, but stretch them a little bit, you know, oh, I, then they realize they can do something that they didn't think they could do, you know, so. But it's, it's a really, a really tough thing. Cause I've talked to parents. There's a group of parents here in town with special kids with special needs. And their biggest fear is what will happen to this person. if we die, if we die, what, who's going to take care of them? You know, that's a, 
that, that's just a really big fear. So. That's exactly where one of the clients that I had living in, she was in her mid forties and her mother was obviously 25 years older, starting to have health issues of her own. And mm -hmm. suddenly this young person who's always depended on their mother, well, not even young, she wasn't that young, um, always depended on her mother, had to look at living in a completely separate home. And it was quite mm -hmm. a transition. I mean, certainly she was excited about it, but there was certain fear too, because it was so unknown. So that was where my thought was when I, when I saw this on your website was, mm -hmm. as you say, <laughs> parents are probably going to predecease their children. That's usually the way it happens. And yeah. so to get that person into a more independent or other situation is, is definitely uh, an advantage. Sure. So. Yeah, absolutely. Now, on your website, you talk about six practices. I think you've talked about mm -hmm. right. two of them. Could you? Uh... I talked about a couple of those. Yeah. So you know, the first one is 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 just this aspect of of what I call securing the relationship by communicating unconditional love for that young adult. You know, to be able to say that you matter no matter what we love you. It's about your being, not about your doing. And to be clear about that. So that's foundational. And then building this stronger relationship, not not one that's based on control and, and trying to get the young adult to do what you want, but one that's based upon helping them develop their separate identity and their independence. Those are kind of foundational. Some people say, well, you need to back off on the relationship. Well, yeah, if it's control and, and, and you're trying to direct and control them, that's true. But don't back off in terms of your support for their independence and their identity, too. And then I, I talked about the healing uh, practices, the forgiveness and apology that often need to be addressed to, to reduce that binding of the negative emotions that occur there. And then the, you know, the... Fifth one is the basically the idea of being firm and being able to set boundaries and say no. So there's a firm foundation to to kind of move off of. I often tell I do this illustration in my workshops I've done with parents. I have one parent play the, the young adult and lean on top of the other person like this. And so the parent has to lean back. And I say, okay, now what's the best way to get out of this situation. If you step out, the person's going to fall down. If you push hard, they may fall back that way. But if you just stand up straight, they have to stand up now on their own. Now, And that's what parents need to do. They need to be able to say no. They need to be able to set limits and have boundaries there. So, and then the last one is just the saying goodbye, the, you know, the grieving aspect of just being able to let go and start to develop a life outside of the kids. I mean, the kids are still going to be involved, but find meaning and purpose outside of the kids because the kids have been so much part of the meaning and purpose for parents uh, during those years of raising them. So. It isn't to some extent watching your kids go out into the world, be productive, responsible human beings. Isn't that a good reflection of hopefully your parenting. I mean, hopefully it wasn't just an accident. <laughs> well, I, I think so. I mean, you, you'd like to think that way. And I, though I, you know, I, I would have to say that, you know, it's important to kind of recognize or understand that when once kids become late teens and young adults, you don't, you cannot continue to direct them. You know, you can't control them. And if they get involved in the in, with drugs or they get involved in uh, other kinds of difficulties or problem problems and relationships and all, you know, they can come from a really good family, but can still derail at some point or get off track. So because uh, I've, I've met with some just wonderful families and I think what's happened here, you know, I, and they, of course, they're asking the question, what have I done? It, it, you know, is it my fault somehow or another? So, All right. 
Jack, what haven't we discussed about either generation that you want listeners to think about? Or have I just done such a good job that I'm just joking? <laughs> well, you've covered, you've covered a lot. I think that um, I think that the sometimes parents uh, suffer from self-inflicted wounds based upon assumptions that they make, faulty assumptions. And the one is that that they can control the young adult because because that's not true. I mean, you might have some leverage if they're living at, living at home, but they can always say, "Well, I'm I'm going." Yeah, you, know, you don't like what I'm doing. I'm leaving. So, and then the the second thing that parents will do is that they feel like they're responsible for the the problems that might exist with that young adult. And I have to say, at that point, uh, you can't use what's happened in the past as an excuse for your behavior now or the young adult's behavior. You know, it may explain some of, it, but you can't say, well. You know, you didn't treat me nicely, so I, that's why I'm the way I am type of thing. You know, so the, so the third thing is that, that I can fix them, you know. And so you keep trying, and that's where you, that's where you get more of that self-inflicted wounding and stuff. And, then I, and I think ultimately that, that the only real change that a, that a parent can pursue that will make a difference is the change in their, their approach to that young adult. You can't change them, so but you can change yourself, and you can become more influential in your young adult's life. Um, so it's better to move and work on yourself than to try to keep working to get your young adult to, to change in a particular way. So, right. So your license is Minnesota only. I understand that, right. um, but you have a ton of resources on your website. Where do we find you on the World Wide Web? Yeah, parentslettinggo.com. So. Well, that's nice and straightforward. And you're on social, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Facebook and LinkedIn and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Just an aside about what's on your, your website, some of your quizzes seem like things I may want to know about myself, but maybe I don't. <laughs> do, uh, do they yeah. get a good response? Well, yeah. I mean, I think sometimes I'm... And, and, I, and I've got a number of those quizzes in this book that I've written too. And I, and I say, I'm not, I'm not putting this in here to make you feel guilty or more <laughs> guilty as a parent, you know, but this, to just highlight where you might be able to work on something, you know, so, uh, but some of those can be kind of um, somewhat indicting, I guess, in a sense that, oh, I guess I'm, I mean, I'm checking a bunch. I'm not, I'm not far from being the, the perfect parent. I haven't, I haven't found that perfect parent yet. So <laughs> I keep looking for, for that person. I'm a legend in my own mind. <laughs> yeah. It was a study done a while back and they asked parents to rate themselves on the excellent good. So the actual percentage of parents who rated themselves as excellent was 3%. So it, it kind of highlights in my mind that Parents are the, the guiltiest segment of our of our society. They always feel like, like oh, I, I could have done it better. Well, yeah, we all could have done it better, but we're, we're not perfect parents. So, and we have to have to acknowledge our imperfections. Yeah, know. yeah. I remember when my kids were like nine, ten, eleven, maybe. Um, I'd read about how they always think that some like, oh, that sibling is my parent's favorite, your mom's favorite. Oh, so sure. I actually said to them one day, okay, which one of you is my favorite? <laughs> and all three of them put their hands up and said, I am. So I thought, okay, <laughs> I've done something right somewhere along the way. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Can I ask you a personal question before we close? Sure. Minnesota. The land of 10,000 lakes, although in my research, I understand it's more like 21,000. If we come to Minnesota, where do we find a nice little resort to relax in on a lake? Which lake? Oh, gosh. Well, there's certainly lots of uh, resorts. I don't pick, know. Pick your favorite uh, child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's an area, uh, uh, one of the big resorts areas is, is Brainerd, Minnesota. It's about two and a half hours north of the Twin Cities. That's a, a quite a 
lovely area. It's on what's called the whitefish chain of lakes up there. So that's probably where I would say there's a couple of really nice resorts up there. I so. used to have a coach who worked out of Minnesota. And I remember mm. flying in and it was just spectacular. All the lakes and all the cottages and the boats. Oh, and, yeah. I tell you, we've had so much rain here. It is just, it's, it's kind of the <laughs> emerald state right now. It oh, is <laughs> unbelievable. So. Yeah. Well, we've had a lot of uh, forest fires here, so I'd rather have uh, your emerald than our, uh, our heat. That's yeah. For sure. We're getting some of that smoke. I mean, it's more from the Canadian side, right? Well, now, that's so. where, yeah. <laughs> That's where you are. Yeah, I'm on the on the west coast though. But, uh, but well, I know yeah. you're on the west coast. Yeah, right. but yeah. no, it's uh, yeah, it's it's uh, our Canadian fires. I'll claim full responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> okay, your website link is in the show notes, and all the links for you are on your page at our website. I do have to ask you. You talked about a book. Are you going to have like a pre-registration, or how do people get on the list for that? Uh, the best thing that I think people could do would be to, uh, go to my website and get on my mailing list because I'll be sending out information on that as soon as it's released. Um, I'm, I'm working with a company that's going to be doing a lot of the kind of marketing on that. So I'm not quite sure what the, okay. what their process is there, but that's the, and then people would also get my blogs because I'm, most of my blogs are really trying to address what. I hear parents struggling with, and so they can, I've probably written, you know, maybe 125 or so blogs and you can kind of look, oh, that's my issue and go. So I really encourage people to go look at the blogs and see if they can find maybe the thing that they're most concerned about. You know, okay. that, that could be helpful to them. So, yeah, as I said earlier, I couldn't believe the number of resources on, on the website. So that's great. Listeners, if you have kids you've dealt with or are dealing with this subject, talk to us. Did launching your kids go without a hitch or were there issues on one side or the other? Leave comments where you're listening or if you're listening at boomwithabang.com, scroll to the bottom of the page and talk to us there. Maybe there was a question I didn't ask Jack. Ask it in the comments and I'll get you an answer. Leave stars and reviews where you can. They help us grow, so be generous. And share this episode. If you're a boomer, launching a young adult child might be history, but it's not for many, and it probably isn't for your kids and grandkids. Jack shared a lot of expertise with us today, and there's even more at his website. Lastly, remember that you can help support this podcast by buying me a coffee. That link is in the show notes. Or sign up at Substack and get new conversations delivered to your inbox. Jack Stoltzfus, first of all, thank you for your patience pulling this together today. We oh. had so many technical issues, but but we made it, so that's good. Thank sure. you for being my guest and sharing so much important information about launching kids. It isn't always easy, but you certainly gave us food for thought, so thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It's it, It's been fun to have this dialogue with you. So That's great. Have a great rest of the week. Mm-hmm.